Previously, I introduced a very brief history of science as it emerged in the 19th century and into the year 1900 when Planck introduced the strange new entity of the quantum into physics. Like others at the time, he believed that the constant and formula at which he had arrived was merely another mathematical fiction on the way towards something more in line with his classical thinking about the universe. After all, it isn't unusual for scientists to draw inspiration from mathematical ideas. The Newtonian era enjoyed tremendous success in practical engineering and technology. In fact, it had enjoyed too much success, as it had hardened the prejudice of researchers that it was genuinely descriptive of reality more generally. And by the mid-19th century, physics became divorced from philosophy in the public mind. Philosophy came to be perceived as a kind of useless metaphysical jargon for snobs in ivory towers. Since Newton had already answered the great mysteries to leave researchers the lesser task of making ever more efficient machines. People were drawn to find more authority in engineers and innovators like Thomas Edison, who were unveiling new marvels of technology every day. It was widely considered an end of history, and all that was left was to inventory the possibilities. The leading researchers at the time, however, were feeling the weight of challenging questions that needed answers. When communicating with the public, modern scientists typically use the terms mechanics and physics and theory interchangeably, as if they all mean the same thing. And I am equally guilty of this myself, but it helps to clarify what's going on when we consider how these terms are related. The innermost of these concentric spheres represents our direct acquaintance with the physical world, our sense impressions. How do we physically interact with the world around us? What does it mean to make an observation or a measurement? Galileo and Newton brought this question into greater focus, but gradually over time, researchers would seek ever greater precision to cast their gaze into macroscopic and microscopic scales of size and distance to discover the limits of what can be known. What they did not expect was that things would only get stranger and harder to explain. The founders of quantum mechanics were themselves the last of the classical physicists, and the experiments they performed are experiments anyone today can perform with a modest budget, free time, and some curiosity. But this is not true today. Modern research is conventional and done by large research institutions all over the world. The classical image of the lone scientist grinding away in his backyard or woodshed, or even Archimedes etching figures in the sand, are things of the past. By mechanics, we mean the conventional language that describes the world in formulas and equations. The objects of quantum physics are atoms, electrons, and photons, and are themselves not directly observable which requires novel methods of detection and greater emphasis on the language for talking about these abstract objects and their properties. Objects once thought to be convenient fictions came to be regarded as real things in the universe, and by the early 20th century, philosophy and physics would once again reunite and begin raising the questions over what it means to say that anything is real. And that takes us to the outermost sphere. By theory, we also mean the ontological question. What does it all mean? Quantum mechanics was not well loved by its creators. In fact, they were quite disappointed when it was realized that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which I will discuss later, placed severe limits on what can possibly be known about any given system. This was not merely some obstacle that could be solved with better instruments. It was a fundamental crack in the foundations of classical physics that even Einstein struggled to accept. A number of competing theories to explain this were devised with Bohr's Copenhagen interpretation, ultimately becoming the orthodox view. I will return with greater emphasis to this issue in the final part of this series. For now, we must survey the flurry of developments prompted by Planck and Einstein at the outset of the 20th century. Planck's quantum was largely received with very little fanfare, as it seemed more like a quick fix than a revelation. Until in 1905, Einstein had his Annus Mirabilis, or Miracle Year. 
Einstein published four papers in that year, each of which was worthy of a Nobel Prize. But his work on the photoelectric effect showed the practical value of Planck's discovery. J.J. Thompson discovered the electron, which only proved the existence of atoms. However, no sooner were they confirmed than they were shown to be comprised of still smaller particles and were not the classical atoms of the early Greeks or even those most familiar to chemists. Thompson's discovery was shortly followed by Ernest Rutherford's discovery that they were comprised of a very tiny nucleus surrounded by a cloud of electrons. As a unit of measurement, the angstrom was established as far back as 1862 in spectroscopy by Anders Jonas Angstrom, and by 1903 it would formally constitute the diameter of a typical hydrogen atom, where nearly all of its mass was tightly packed into its nucleus, which was 10,000 times smaller. In fact, it's an interesting bit of trivia that hydrogen was first discovered in the Sun before it was discovered on Earth as the most common and abundant of the elements. The opening of the 20th century saw scientists pushing up against macroscopic and microscopic extremes in the precision of measurement, and it would be Albert Einstein who would launch the Age of Illumination in 1905 on both fronts, by first unifying space and time into space-time at the macroscopic end of the scale, and using Planck's constant to unify wave-like behavior with particle-like behavior at the microscopic end of the scale. The problem, however, is that there seemed to be no way to further unify the physics that worked at each extreme. For our purposes here, we will focus only on the particle physics of the age. Niels Bohr would follow up on Einstein's work to find another application of Planck's constant to work out the inner structure of the hydrogen atom and introduce the concept known as a quantum leap. In Bohr's model, a negatively charged electron orbits a positively charged nucleus at a ground state. When a photon randomly strikes the electron, the added energy changes the orbit for an instant before releasing another photon and returning to the ground state. However, as mentioned in Part 3, the quantum nature of the system is defined in discrete units, 1HF, 2HF, 3HF, etc., which cannot be split further into fractions. This means that while the electron is a particle in orbit most of the time, the photon forces it to exhibit wave-like behavior between orbital states. In other words, a quantum leap is like a magic trick in which the electron disappears from one position to reappear at another that is not limited to the speed of light. Hence, spooky action at a distance. To understand how this works, Consider a typical guitar string, but with each end connected to form a circle. When plucked, the string promptly goes from a ground state with no wavelength to a higher energy state. In this example, we see four different states of a single string. As a guitar string tightens, it takes increasing amounts of energy to pluck it, and those energy levels represent higher notes. Where the waves intersect, the dotted lines are node points also known as zero displacement. Lightly touched at certain nodes as the string is plucked will result in an interference pattern or chime, which is analogous to the dark bands in Young's experiment that we saw earlier in this series. When there is a change in the energy state of an electron, it leaps from one state to another, but does not actually traverse a path in space it instantaneously teleports from one position to another in what is known as a quantum leap. However, Bohr's model was simple and only worked for hydrogen, where we have only one proton and one electron. Nevertheless, it led the way in showing that at the Planck scale, as it would be called, there was a duality between particles and waves that was similar to the space-time duality Einstein had already discovered at the other extreme in 1905 and completed in 1915 with the general theory of relativity. Over the next decade, following Bohr's work, a legion of future Nobel laureates would also find value in Planck's constant in their own formulas, the most important of which was Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which struck at the heart of Laplace's demon more than a century earlier. 
As we saw earlier in the series, Laplace suggested that a perfectly omniscient entity would be one that could, by some incredibly advanced technology, know both the exact position of a particle and its momentum in the exact same instant. But Heisenberg showed that even under the most ideal conditions, you can only observe position or momentum in any given instant. Worse than that, the more precisely you measure the position of a particle, the less precisely you can know its momentum and vice versa, such that the perfect knowledge of one variable means zero knowledge of the other. In other words, the most that can possibly be known about any system at any given moment is 50%, not 100%. Heisenberg had shattered the myth of a perfectly knowable system, and this would spark the great debate between the giants of 20th century physics. And that is where we will begin in the final part of this series. <laughs>